Chief Executive of Humanists UK, the secular organisation. Andrew, afternoon to you. Afternoon. Nice to have you with us. Um, obvious question, does it matter? I think it does matter. It, well, it matters for two reasons. First, I think it it's good to know where we are as a country. You know, we're not just individuals, we're a whole society. And I think that such a big change as this, a move from a majority Christian organisation to a you know, minority Christian organisation where a huge plurality of people are non-religious matters um, so that we can understand ourselves. And I think it matters as well politically because a lot of aspects of our politics, our law, our government, our education system still assume a sort of majority Christianity, whether it's prayers in schools, whether it's state funded Christian schools that choose Christian children, whether it's you know bishops in parliament. And this should be, I think, these uh, results today should be a, a spur and an encouragement to knock some of those anachronisms on the head. Yeah, I guess there's also, and it depends on the faith, I suppose, you know, how, how much of a cultural component is there to one's faith etc so i think you would find that perhaps in in a greater manifestation in islam than you might in christianity um uh, however, having said that, there's a lot of underpinning of things that we're not always aware. I mean, the head of state is also head of the church and things like that. And some might argue that, be it subliminal or otherwise, Andrew, that even if you don't fess up to being a, a Christian or a practicing Christian, you are, whether you know it or not, still roughly rubbing along by the basic tenets and rules of Christianity. Some people say that. I don't think that's right. I mean, it's certainly true that... Um, people are complicated and we've got beliefs from all over, you know, um, how do we decide what we believe? Well, it's a complicated, uh, you know, uh, mix of our parents, our schooling, the television programs we watch, the books we read, the people we encountered, the ideas we've had, um, the emotions we've experienced, the experiences we've had in our lives. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that a non-religious person like me, whose parents were humanists, whose grandparents were humanists, whose great grandparents were humanists, has been affected by some Christian ideas, but then Christians have been affected by some non-religious ideas and, you know, by other philosophical ideas. But I think our culture is very complicated. I mean, we've got one of the most complicated cultures in the world, actually, because of the way our country, our, our, our national culture has been exposed to so many international influences um, over time. So I think it, you know, it, it, it is important to remember that there uh, are Christian aspects of our society, Christian aspects of our uh, morality but there are also uh, non-christian aspects and i think what we what we want to do is not to replace um a christian tyranny of the past with a new secular tyranny or a new tyranny of some other religion but to take this opportunity where we see that we're a very mixed society now to create the sort of laws and, and political situation that will treat everyone equally whatever their beliefs and that you know i think is what this should be an opportunity to do not replace one tyrant with another i mean often you know, a, a religion can provide uh, a, a a fairly reasonable social cohesion to a society perhaps maybe that's that that perhaps defines what i was trying to say before uh, mm. andrew more more accurately in the sense of the you know to, to coin the phrase we we kind of sing from one hymn sheet <laughs> and that is th that actually serves us rather well even if we don't practice in any overt fashion there is something rather useful about having a commonality that we have a nod to or adhere to in varying ways. I would say two things about that. The first thing is that um, a big majority opinion that ties people together is all very well as long as you're not one of the small minorities who you know have a different view or who suffer by that. Cultures that are very cohesive together and quite homogenous can be very nice to be part of, but they can also be very oppressive for people who are different in, in different ways. So I don't think we want to have um, the sort of cohesion that means we all have to think the same or believe the same. And the second thing is I don't think that religion is necessary for cohesion. I mean, if we look at something very recent that we've all been through together as a country, the pandemic and the efforts that we had um, around that for neighbours to help neighbours, for people to help each other, for compassion for others. I mean, religious organisations and individuals played their part in it, but there was no difference between the things that they were doing and the things that non-religious people were doing. And I think that a safer basis for a shared and cohesive society is values rather than beliefs. I mean, what's something that a Christian, a Muslim, a Hindu, a humanist 
um, a Jew and some of any beliefs can agree on. We can all roughly agree to sort of timeless human principles like the fact that it's better to be healthy than unhealthy, the fact that if we want help for ourselves, we can help others, the fact that we want others to be happy just we want to be happy ourselves, um, things like democracy, things mm. like rule of law, things like you know defending government that will hold, keep the peace. These are things I think that can be common values without the need for common beliefs. And do you sense, is, is there any peril or problem with uh, other religions that might change the face of some parts of society? You know, there's something to be said perhaps about the status quo. And again, to hark back to the common hymn sheet, etc. If we function in a certain way and a society allows other belief systems to come in, and on one hand that's great, we're not a dictatorship, that's the whole point. But if those other elements substantially change the status quo, it, it might be argued that actually that's, that's not a good thing for society. I mean, I don't think that there are negative changes at the moment to fear in, 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 in that sense. Um, I think that, um, I would hope rather, that people in a, in a situation of difference um, are more likely to support for others the, the rights they want for themselves. I mean, why is it that people are able to be um, pursuing different religions or beliefs in this country. It's because, especially in recent times, since the domination of churches has, has relaxed, mm -hmm. it's because we have a culture of freedom of belief, you know, in our country, and we have protections for legal rights to freedom of belief through the Human yeah. Rights Act and other laws that we have. So I think that as long as we uphold that common framework, which doesn't have its basis in any one particular religion or non-religious belief, but has a, has a common basis, then I think we'll be all right. But you're right, of course, to say that those that value needs to be defended. And how do we defend it in the absence of common beliefs? Well, I think that we need to, that's maybe another wake up call of these statistics. We can, we can no longer rely on a common belief. How are we going to sustain and support our common values? It has to be done through the education system. Government has to take it seriously. We have to have a serious conversation as a country about what we believe and why in terms of practical values and the structures of our society. But, you know, I think that's exciting. I think that change is good. It can be refreshing. If you if you just do the same old thing every day without thinking why you're doing it, maybe you're not doing the right thing. And so I think it's an opportunity to reflect and, and if we have to, to change. Andrew, thank you. Uh, thorough stuff. Really appreciate your time. Andrew Copson is the chief executive of, the, of Humanist UK. They're a secular organisation. You might put all of that under the caveat. He, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Uh, I think the, the question I can only really raise on this is the one I asked Andrew there at the beginning. Does it matter? I remember ticking that box on the census and I did tick Christian. Now I'm not a practicing Christian but I have a sort of a sense sometimes it's more overt than others and you could call it if you like unqualified tradition. It's a bit like trying to quantify what truth. Why, tr why does tradition matter? Why does it matter about elbows on the table? Why does it matter about, I don't know, holding the door open for somebody? Why does it matter that we have a two-minute silence uh, in November every year? Why, do we, why does it matter that we, you know, uh, have this thing called a wedding where the woman traditionally wears white and the guy has this morning suit? And what, why does any of that matter? And if you were asked to quantify it and qualify it, you, you might kind of struggle. It, it might be a bit tricky to go, well, I don't know. It's just there. And the fact that it's been there. But that, do you know what? That doesn't dilute the authenticity. It doesn't dilute your argument because you can't necessarily find the, the right wordage to be able to defend it in a court of law.